Hello there. Thank you so much. We want to thank the RSDA for having us tonight to share with you. We're very excited to share with you the proclaimed DRG therapy, which for me as a physician, I have found to be the most transformative therapy for my patients with CRPS. My name is Dr. Kiran V. Patel. I am an interventional pain physician at the Spine and Pain Institute of New York in Manhattan. I am also the director of neurosurgical pain at Lenox Hill Hospital and a professor of anesthesiology and pain medicine at the Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. And I train anesthesia residents as well as um, pain fellows. Dr. Anthony. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to echo what Dr. Patel said. Uh, it's truly a, a, an honor and a privilege to, to be here tonight with you all. Uh, my name is Ajay Antony. I'm an interventional pain physician at the Orthopedic Institute in Gainesville, Florida. After spending time in academics, after my training at the University of Florida, I'm now in private practice and uh, very, very excited to share with you my experience uh, with a game-changing therapy uh, called DRG stimulation. So briefly, I'm going to roll through what our plan for tonight will be, which we're going to talk about chronic pain and its overall management. We're going to talk about neurostimulation and the differences between neurostimulation and DRG therapy. And we're going to overview the proclaimed DRG neurostimulation system, the steps to achieve or obtain proclaimed DRG therapy, and then we're going to open it up for question and answer. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a section there for question and answer. Um, we will have somebody live who will be answering questions if you type them in there. And then we're also gonna have time at the end of the session um, for a question and answer, additional question and answer session. And as we move into, uh, you know, a very specific therapy for a specific indication, it's important to give uh, a, a broad overview and kind of come to an understanding about what exactly chronic pain is and the burden that it causes uh, for, for those affected by uh, this process. The first thing that's important to know is that chronic pain is a disease, much like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. Chronic pain is, is a disease in itself. And in its origins, the painful response of the human body is protective, as we'll talk about in a moment, but chronic pain is the process of that protective mechanism turned into a disease. There are a couple things to know about the scope of chronic pain and chronic uh, pain illness in the United States. And the first thing to know is that it's extremely common. Uh, one in 10 Americans globally is diagnosed with a new chronic painful condition each year. There are over 50 million people in the United States that suffer from chronic pain on a daily basis. Uh, the next thing to know about it is actually in that last statement is that people suffer from it and chronic pain can be severe. Uh, the kind of chronic pain response that the body generates in terms of um, a protective process turning into a debilitating disease can range in severity, much like heart disease ranges in severity, hypertension ranges in severity, for some patients, chronic pain can be life-altering and debilitating. So chronic pain is common and it's severe. The third thing to know about the scope of chronic pain in this country and really all over the world is that it's costly. And when I say costly, I don't mean just from a financial standpoint. It's debilitating in nature. It can be a financial burden for many, many folks. It can also be a social disturbance in terms of affecting those socially and affecting quality of life in a negative way. Uh, so chronic pain as a whole is an extremely common condition. It's debilitating and can be extremely severe, and it's costly both from a financial standpoint and a personal standpoint to each one of those individual patients. As I mentioned, pain as a natural response to the human body is a protective mechanism. And when the body feels harm or senses the possibility for harm, pain is the natural response of the human body and the nervous system. There are special fibers in the body called pain receptors. And when that pain receptor senses a painful stimuli or a signal, that pain receptor travels up the spinal cord to the brain where it's processed as a painful signal 
and tells the body that they are suffering from pain. That pain can be acute due to uh, uh, an acute injury or a surgical uh, procedure type pain, or it can be chronic. And chronic pain is different than acute pain in that it's defined as lasting at least six months or longer than the expected recovery from whatever disease process or injury, or in many cases, surgery that caused the pain in the first place. So the way that is easy for me to think about chronic pain and when we teach our uh, trainees and fellows about what chronic pain is, an easy way to think about it is the body's own response or the nervous system gone out of whack. And the way that it goes out of whack or becomes abnormal is variable from person to person. Many folks develop severe pain after only a mild injury, and many folks develop only mild pain after a severe injury. So the different responses from person to person is something that we know and understand about chronic pain, but it's something as a whole that's very, very difficult to predict. The symptoms of chronic pain can also be extremely variable from person to person. Some folks can feel burning and tingling, Some folks can feel dull aches. Uh, This natural response turned into a disease process when it is chronic pain, again, varies from person to person, can range in severity, and can present itself with a variety of symptoms that can be sometimes difficult for both the patient and many physicians to understand. The treatments for chronic pain are wide ranging. Uh, The job of folks like Dr. Patel and myself on a daily basis is to match the appropriate therapy with the severity of the disease that the patient is suffering from. And we do our best to understand where that disease comes from or the inciting incident or events that led to this disease process that is a chronic painful condition. And then we do our best to match up the most effective and appropriate therapies with that disease process or chronic pain condition that the patient is suffering from. These range in a wide spectrum of possibilities. Uh, There are non-invasive or minimally invasive procedures uh, or medications like cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy, rehabilitation, biofeedback. Even within this category of non-invasive options, there are different options that are specific for different Uh, types of painful conditions that folks have, and we do our best to match up those appropriately. There are also minimally invasive options. Uh, Some of those minimally invasive options include nerve blocks, uh, ablative therapies, uh, stronger medications, which some would argue may actually be maximally invasive. Some of the medications that are commonly used in a more historical perspective, such as high-dose opioids, often lead to side effects that are intolerable for the patient and really only reach a certain level of efficacy that limits their effectiveness in the long term. And so uh, that's a little bit of a a questionable uh, point in terms of how invasive opioid medications are, but they are an option for pain and and appropriate in some cases. The third tier of of kind of the spectrum of care for treating a chronic painful condition Uh, involves higher level procedures. So this is radiofrequency therapy, implantable drug pumps, and a subgroup of therapies called neurostimulation, which is the foundation of of my practice and the foundation of Dr. Patel's practice. And the reason for that is because it leads to the best outcomes for our patients. Within the group of neurostimulation therapies, which involve using low dose electrical energy to treat different types of painful conditions, There is a a therapy called dorsal root ganglion stimulation uh, or DRG therapy because we don't like to say dorsal root ganglion over and over. We start tripping up over our words. Uh, That is very, very effective and the gold standard for certain types of painful conditions, complex regional pain syndrome, causalgia, and focal neuropathic pain. As we move into uh, discussing DRG therapy, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Patel uh, to share her experiences and some of the details about this therapy that we've introduced. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. So before we before we do, delve into DRG therapy, I'm gonna take a step back and explain 
uh, spinal cord stimulation, also known as SCS. And again, just as Dr. Anthony said, we abbreviate it because we don't want to trip over our words. So spinal cord stimulation is also often referred to as SCS. It is a well-established therapy and has been recommended by doctors for more than 50 years. About worldwide, approximately 34,000 patients every year undergo spinal cord stimulation. And what spinal cord stimulation consists of is mild electrical pulses that are delivered to pain signals uh, to basically alter their, their uh, fashion and ability and their strength as they move from the spinal cord to the brain. What this translate to, translates to for the patient is that they may have a reduction in pain, which is, allows them to be more functional um, and return to a more normal lifestyle. And before DRG therapy, the bulk of my practice was offering patients SCS therapy. Initially, for the first, before dorsal ganglion therapy was really established, um, the bulk of the medical liter literature looking at neurostimulation focused on spinal cord stimulation. And the research indicates that for many CRPS patients and causalgia patients, they had an improvement in their pain. Um, however, there were some shortcomings of the therapy. We found that for certain patients, they felt unwanted tingling or paresthesias. Um, and then for other patients, they found stimulation in areas of the body that were not painful to them, and they found it irritating and, and distracting. Um, Alternatively, patients who initially had great efficacy of the treatment of their pain with SCS um, found that this, the efficacy faded over time. So those are some of the shortcomings that we have found with spinal, traditional spinal cord stimulation for patients with CRPS. The advent of DRG kind of solved many of these challenges. Um, dorsal root ganglion therapy has allowed us to achieve therapeutic coverage of a patient's pain in difficult to treat very focal areas without the distracting or irritating uh, tingling or paresthesia sensations as we often refer to them as. So what is the DRG? Well, it's a cluster of nerves um, along the spine and there are some for the left side of the body and some for the right side. And it's, it's quite symmetric in every patient. It's quite predictable um, which areas of the body are responsible, each DRG is responsible for. And the DRG can be thought of as a relay station. It's where the sensory information and with that, any painful signals from the periphery, from the extremities, kind of comes in and relays and connects to the spinal cord and then ascends to the brain and tells us that we're experiencing pain. The idea of DRG therapy is a type of targeted neurostimulation. So for any particular dorsal root ganglion, we're able to apply um, mild electrical pulses, which will almost act as a filter to stop the transmission of painful signals or blunt their effect. And what this results in is a, a paresthesia-free or a tingling-free, so the patients don't feel any tingling, but they feel pain relief in that very focal region. Um, and this has been, you know, this is FDA approved to treat um, CRPS and causalgia in areas of the lower body, including the pelvis, the groin, the hip, knee, ankle, and foot. One of the thing, one of the shortcomings, as I mentioned, of traditional spinal cord stimulation is that if a patient, for example, had a CRPS of the foot, um, in order to capture their pain or to treat their pain, I would have to offer them stimulation in areas in addition to just the foot. That may include the lower leg, both above and below the knee, and it might even be the entire body from the waist down. 
Now for that patient who doesn't need stimulation in other areas of the body, it's a waste of energy. But with traditional stimulation where patients would feel that tingling sensation, they often were either irritated by the tingling in non-painful areas or found it very distracting. With the proclaimed DRG therapy, we're able to focally target an area of the body and reduce the energy that we are delivering to offer this pain therapy. And in addition, we are able to save patients from having to feel any type of unwanted tingling. What they experience is simply the absence of pain. So Abbott's DRG therapy has been proven to be safe and effective in the largest neurostimulation trial for the treatment of CRPS and causalgia. Um, and what we see within this data is not only is it extremely effective, but for the year duration that these patients were followed, the level of pain relief was consistent for the entire duration of that year. And that is not something that we have seen in other areas of neurostimulation research. Similarly, globally, there have been over 18 studies over the past seven years, which have, which have echoed these effects for the use of DRG therapy in patients with CRPS and causalgia. One of the benefits of, of the of the system is that a patient is able to try it out. It's kind of a try before you buy, meaning you get to have a temporary version of the therapy placed and it's typically taped to your back and Dr. Anthony is gonna go into greater detail over that, but you use it for up to seven to 10 days and, and it proves to the patient what it will do for their pain. And in my office, I'm always trying to set functional goals. So the discussions that we have before the trial with a patient is, you know, what are the things that your pain is preventing you from doing? That might be something as simple as taking a walk, you know, checking the mail, walking from the door to the mailbox because their, their CRPS is so severe. Um, so it's important to set those functional goals um, and then see how patients do during the trial. And the results that I have seen in my practice is that it's, it's, this is probably, I, I feel privileged to be able to deliver this therapy to patients because it's so transformative to people's lives. And I tell my patients, whatever you get in the trial is what the implant is gonna bring. So if, it's, if you don't like this trial, you're not gonna like the implant. If you're able to be much more functional with the trial, that's what you would be like after the, the implant. And what I have found is that Patients are, by and large, so much more functional with, with this therapy. And I've also seen that they're able to reduce medication, not just opioid medication, but also neuropathic medication. Um, people, people go from being you know, on disability and being unemployed because they're, they feel they're unemployable to, to finding meaningful employment. Um, I've seen all kinds of changes in my patients with this therapy. So this is a very important slide here. In that study that we talked about, the largest um, study looking at CRPS and causalgia and neurostimulation, um, of those patients who received DRG therapy, 81.4% they had an, a reduction in pain of 81.4% at 12 months. And of those patients, 86% of them had a persistent and consistent pain, le pain relief level. This is very, very, very different than what we see in uh, other, other types of neurostimulation. There have been so many studies kind of explaining that for other types of spinal cord stimulation, we often see a fade of efficacy of the treatment at three months, at six months, at nine months. But for DRG therapy, we do not see that. And part of that is because we are targeting a very specific bundle of nerves. Dr. Anthony, do you have any um, anything you wanted to share about this? I know you've seen this in your practice as well in terms of the sustainability of the therapy. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Patel. That was a, a great uh, kind of overview of the therapy. Um, 
the the funny thing about this uh, this slide in particular is that you know to most folks these numbers and statistics and percentages are uh, much more boring than some of the interesting and cool anatomy that Dr. Patel was showing. But to those of us who have studied neuromodulation for quite some time and made it the focus of our careers, this is actually the most exciting slide and the most exciting thing we can see. Because with dorsal root ganglion stimulation, we're able to see a higher efficacy. So in terms of the percentage of pain relief that these therapies provide, it's higher than conventional stimulation or traditional spinal cord stimulation. We also see a higher responder rate in that more patients who get a trial or a test run of DRG stimulation end up responding to the therapy. And the third thing that is maybe not in this slide, but is definitely something that I wanted to mention specific to my practice and definitely Dr. Patel's practice as well, is that we're able to treat a different group of patients of whom we would not have anything to offer for long-term therapeutic treatment options. And so this is definitely something that I discuss with patients on a daily basis and something that really feeds the, the practice uh, to offer this as a therapy. So one, I actually want to, uh, one of my patients who is, is probably, um, who comes to mind right now, because uh, I just spoke to her the other day after not having heard from her for years. Um, so she, she received her DRG implant about four years ago, and she had had a traumatic crush injury. Uh, basically, the, her foot was run over um, by a bus in New York City. Only in New York City did things like this happen. So her foot was run over by, by a bus, and she had a horrible crush injury and nerve damage. Um, I went on to develop CRPS, and she had previously been employed as a um, hairstylist um, and where she would stay, have to stand on her feet. And she'd been doing this for about I don't know, 15, 12, 15 years. Um, and so with her, after her DRG therapy, not only was she able to completely stop taking opioid medication, but she was able to resume her full schedule of standing on her feet, you know, anywhere from, 10 to 12 hours a day and, and, and doing clients hair. And, you know, for her, that was her functional goal that she set during the trial. And that was something that translated to exactly what she did during the trial is exactly what she had in the implant. Um, and so I, I, she, she, you know, she was off of all meds. She had the stimulation from the DRG and I didn't hear from her for years. And I just, I was, going over her old charts and I, I saw her name and I said, you know, let me call her and see how she's doing. She hasn't seen a doctor. She hasn't had any pain. She uses her stimulator. She's, she has her own salon now. And that implant was four years ago. And the same level of pain relief that she had from day one, she still has four years later. So, you know, it's, it's really astounding the, the types of changes we see with patients. One of the other areas um, we see not just pain scores decreasing and people becoming um, able to tolerate standing or sitting longer, is we actually see that people's social engagement and their overall general health improves. Another patient of mine, um, one of the most remarkable things, which, which kind of opened my eyes, was that she said she, with her DRG therapy, she was able to stand and prepare meals. So she was able to make healthier food choices and she didn't need to take kind of pick up grab and go type food and which is essentially fast food. Um, so she was able to stand at, at, at the stove and cook kale and, um, you know, and she was so excited about that. So we see and we're seeing by looking at patients systematically in, you know, through various quality of life surveys, we're seeing that patients with DRG therapy, not only do they regain physical function, but they also gain uh, regain social function and improvements in their overall general health. So we'd like to share with you a, a DRG therapy testimonial video. The patient in this video is uh, suffers from post-amputation pain. 
And post amputation pain, as a as a physician, I can tell you this is actually very similar to uh, CRPS and causalgia type pain. Um, so I think it's very applicable to this audience. I always knew that there was better out there. So it was just a matter of finding that better. I'm the kind of guy that if something comes up and I want to do it, I'm going to try to do it. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when I was 19. I had sprained my ankle in 91, uh, fused it in 95. I was killing myself. I was taking 10 pain pills a day and drinking and working 68 hours a week and just trying to get through. And uh, I told him, I said, I need to do something to, to, you know, be mobile and to reduce some of this pain. And they said, well, if you want to be mobile, you should cut it off. And uh, so that's what I did. For me, it was not a loss, it was a gain. I, I, I started to get my life back, which was huge. After that, I started to have um, nerve pain in my leg, started to um, increase. People don't understand chronic pain, it can be debilitating. When I had the DRG inserted, I wasn't expecting anything because I didn't want to set myself up. And I left my doctor's office, did a five mile walk around Central Park, which up to that point, I had not walked five miles in probably five or six years. Literally within a block, I looked at my wife and I said, I think this technology is gonna change my life. Like I could tell then that the pain was so minimal that I knew we were good. I say probably even in high school, I wasn't as active as I am. Oh, I'm doing way more than I did. Tony and I both work hard at improving our whatever skill it is we're doing in the outdoors, and that's that's part of our relationship. Is we're we're kind of passionate about that, and passionate about getting other people to improve their outdoor activities. There's a lot of people out there like me that need this help that don't have the drive or the emotional stability to seek this stuff out. So for me, it was got to find something and now I'm at a point in my life that got to help people find out about it. I've always for some reason thank God had a really positive attitude you know that's 90% of the game right your heart in your head can get you through a lot of stuff so yeah there's hope is fine but knowledge is fine. <laughs> That was a that was a very powerful video and uh, you know inspiring. Just as Dr. Patel's patient story was was inspiring to me as well. Um, you know, I think that Dr. Patel and I could spend uh, hours discussing different patients, but I would like to share a quick uh, a quick patient story with, with you all as well because I think that really illustrates some of the important points that we're discussing today. And at the heart of all the details and all the science are. Uh, you know, patients improving their pain and suffering and ultimately their quality of life, which is why uh, we, we go to work every day. And so I had a young patient, uh, as we know, this disease process called complex regional pain syndrome, RSD, causalgia, uh, whatever you want to call it, affects all ages and, you know, just does, does not discriminate. I had a young patient uh, who was an undergraduate uh, at a neighboring school. I, I'm a University of Florida Gator. And so uh, they went to the rival school that I don't say by name, uh, but, uh, but we still did our best to, to treat her, and we did a really great job with what I'm about to share with you. Uh, we saw her after she had developed complex regional pain syndrome in her ankle after a relatively minor ankle sprain, which for many folks uh, would be an expected inconsequential event in their life. To her, this changed her life. She ended up with swelling, pain, stiffness, color changes, many of the classic symptoms that we see with complex regional pain syndrome and had seen many, many other doctors before she came to me uh, to see what other options were out there. This was several years ago when dorsal root ganglion stimulation was available, uh, but uh, me personally, um, I did not have as much experience as I have now with it, and so I uh, was just integrating it into my practice. Uh, she had over 40 nerve blocks 
that lasted a couple of hours for her of pain relief, and it was still worthwhile for her to get these nerve blocks over and over uh, without any sustainable relief. She told me that she had, you know, really inspiring and amazing career aspirations to go to graduate school and become a scientist, but she couldn't pass her classes because she was sleepy and zonked out on the medications that she was on. She was on many, many different combinations of medications to some patients that would be extremely dangerous. And she also had an old spinal cord simulator. She had the stimulator placed and it was placed in order to treat pain from her ankle down. And so she needed a very small area of coverage, we call it, or overlapping of this pleasant tingling that traditional spinal cord stimulation did. But she felt intense tingling all the way up and down her leg. And she was always tied to this controller that she had to adjust the strength of the tingling because when she went from a standing position to an up to a flat position, the intensity of the tingling changed dramatically. And that is a very common problem with older versions of spinal stimulation. So uh, we did this procedure for her. She got off all her medications. She had over 90% pain relief. And now she's just about to graduate uh, her, her graduate program. And so really to kind of illustrate a lot of the things that we talked about, uh, treating focal pain and complex regional pain syndrome is an amazing use of this therapy. And it's something that, uh, that we do on a regular basis now and really has become the standard of care. As we move forward and talk about the details of the device itself, dorsal root ganglion stimulation is the only FDA approved DRG technology. So conventional or traditional spinal cord stimulation treats a large area of pain by stimulating nerves in the spinal cord and dorsal root ganglion stimulation treats only an individual nerve on each lead because it targets a very specific anatomical structure called the DRG that correlates with the epicenter or relay point of that patient's painful process and the epicenter and region of the body that that nerve pain changes from a normal painful signal that most patients feel to a hyperactive signal where the nerve pain is really out of whack and causing these terrible changes that we talk about with complex regional pain syndrome. Other versions of spinal cord stimulation are not able to stimulate the DRG because DRG stimulation, as we we're discussing today, operates at over a thousand times less energy. And when we talk about low energy therapies, that offers us the ability to not have the patient experience that tingling or paresthesia, we call it. The medical word for tingling is paresthesia. So there's no tingling that's sensed from the device because the device is turned down so low. And also that makes the battery last an incredibly long amount of time without the need for recharging daily. And so my patient that I explained to you was tied to her controller, was also tied to her charger. She said she wanted to go out and have a social life and engage with her friends and colleagues and have a boyfriend and do the normal stuff that, that college kids do. But she was engaging and interacting and socializing with her controller and her charger. And these are not the things that uh, lead to a better quality of life. And so when we talk about you know, real, real success, and real success means you know, those types of numbers that you saw earlier in the slides. Real success means pain relief and a functional improvement or an improvement in quality of life. <laughs> As we move forward with looking at the technology uh, gadgets, if you will, these are familiar things. Uh, many of us have an iPhone. I have an iPhone in my hand right now. And, uh, and this is what the controller looks like. But my patients don't see that controller very much. Because when we program the stimulator, we program it at such a low amplitude or energy level that the patient does not feel any tingling from the device. And we set it there. And that controller goes in a drawer. The charger is absent because there is no charger. So this is a recharge-free device that lasts many, many years along the lines of six to eight years, maybe even longer for some patients. And it's ready to be upgraded with technology that's coming in the future. Dr. Patel and I are so lucky to be practicing in the time that we are, because as interventional pain physicians with a focus on neuromodulation or spinal cord stimulation, dorsal root ganglion stimulation, we're in this era where things are changing so rapidly. And so this device 
not only is MRI ready, but has the ability to be upgraded in the future when new technology comes down the pipeline. And so as we look at how dorsal root ganglion stimulation gets to our patients, uh, the evaluation by a pain management specialist is the first option. Chronic pain is treated by a variety of different types of physicians, and only a fellowship-trained or specialty-trained physician uh, in your area is going to be able to offer these advanced therapies at a high level. And this is something that Dr. Patel and I spend, spent a lot of our time uh, learning ourselves, and then now we spend a lot of our time teaching others because we feel very strongly that uh, the proper training to perform these procedures safely and choose patients wisely uh, is necessary to be able to implement them uh, into our practice. So seeing a specialist is the first thing to do. Your, your doctor will talk about this uh, unique therapy uh, with you if you're a candidate. And the first thing that he or she will discuss with you is a trial. And that trial is a test drive of the therapy. And after learning about a new therapy in a relatively short doctor's visit, which lasts 15, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, however the case may be, it's always best for a patient to go and seek out more information about these therapies because this is a big decision that has quality of life changing implications in a positive way, but it's always best to seek out as much information as possible before engaging into a new therapy or a new surgery or a new uh, minimally invasive procedural option. And so uh, there's an action card that is available to communicate with the team. And the team is spelt with a capital T because neuromodulation or the implementation of these therapies is a team sport. There's a physician who takes the appropriate steps to identify uh, the condition that a patient's suffering from and explain some of the therapeutic or procedural options that are available. There's the staff of the physician who has a big role in organizing these appointments and procedures and follow-ups at the appropriate times. And then for neuromodulation, dorsal root ganglion stimulation, a critical member of the team is our Abbott representative. And I have a wonderful Abbott representative. Her name is Dallas Graham. And she spends a lot of time before we do anything for the patient, educating patients in terms of how the process will go, oftentimes reinforcing some of the things that we talked about in the office, and really form a circle of communication that informs the patient to the highest level and makes everybody feel comfortable that there's no unanswered questions or uh, I's not dotted or T's not crossed before a procedure. Uh, Dr. Patel, do you have anything to add in terms of the process of explaining neurostimulation or DRG stimulation to a patient with the team? You know, I, I, I think it's always a layered approach. It's a lot of information, um, and that's why I like uh, how working closely with our Abbott representatives because, you know, it allows us to deliver the information and then have the patient the opportunity to kind of ask questions after they've had some time to let it digest. Um, and that, that's both before the trial, during the trial, after the trial, in between the, the period from trial to implant. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very useful team approach. Um, and for my patients, you know, it's the same team taking care of them for the trial that it is for the implant. And I think that continuity of, of patient care is very important. Um, and it, it creates a really good experience for the patients. And so as we've been talking about a trial, the details of that is a test drive. And this is one of the few opportunities in medicine where before a patient has the opportunity to dive headfirst into a surgery or to a medication or to a procedure, this is one of the few opportunities that we have to test it first. And this is a test run of the actual stimulation procedure where the energy is being delivered to the exact spot with a 15 to 20 minute injection type procedure without any incision. And the energy source or the battery or IPG is taped to the outside of the body for about five to seven days. During that trial period, the patient is able to see exactly how he or she will experience pain relief from the therapy. 
And if it provides meaningful quality of life changing pain relief, then we have the opportunity to move forward with the uh, implanted device. The implanted device is performed in a 60 to 90 minute, uh, sometimes shorter outpatient surgical procedure, just as in the same way that the 15 to 20 minute outpatient trial is performed with an injection type procedure. And the trial system and the permanent system look very, very similar. For the trial system, temporary leads are the exact same leads that is implanted for the permanent system. There's an external battery that's very similar to the internal battery, maybe a little bit larger. And there's a patient controller that, is, that enables both the patient, the physician, and the representative to control the energy delivery from the outside. So this is Apple Bluetooth technology that many of us are familiar with. And again, when my family member goes for a knee surgery or my family member goes for a back surgery or is placed on a medication, we don't have the opportunity to test drive that therapy or procedure or surgery in the same way that we do with this procedure. Many of my patients are surprised at how minimally invasive the trial is. It's really nothing more than an injection, except instead of injecting local anesthetic or a steroid, the small flexible wire, which is the lead, is inserted into the appropriate spot, and the patient goes home uh, shortly afterwards. But the trial procedure is a window into what this therapy is going to be like in real life and offers the ability to trial it first. We've talked about the implanted system, and in reality, that's very, very similar to the trial. The implanted system, which is implanted in a relatively short surgical procedure that's typically performed on an outpatient basis, involves three parts. One is the leads, which go in the exact same spot that the leads were placed for the trial. The battery is implanted a few centimeters underneath the skin either in the flank love handle area or the upper buttocks area. And then the patient controller, which is familiar to both the patient and the physician from the trial period, is the same one that's used. Many of my patients are uh, you know, not too familiar with the process when the trial is initiated and they come with, with uh, you know, a sense of, um, of uncertainty. And when they come back for the lead pull, uh, which involves just simply removing the temporary leads through the skin five to seven days later, the, uh, the, the look on their face is often uh, astounding. Uh, the, the relief that most of my patients get along the lines of 85 to 90 percent, just as we saw in those statistics, is, is truly amazing. Uh, it's not a uh, small amount of pain relief for most of these patients. Uh, it's dramatic quality of life changing pain relief uh, that, uh, that allows them in the trial to see what the, uh, what the potential for their future looks like moving forward with a newfound system of pain relief. An implanted system is, uh, does not come um, without risks. And so, uh, you know, there are a few risks to the procedure that a physician uh, takes time to explain with the procedure. But when we do any procedure in medicine, the risk-benefit ratio or the benefits of pain relief and quality of life improvement uh, outweigh those, those risks, then we move forward. And for my patients, uh, that, is a, that is a resounding yes in 90-plus percent of these uh, dorsal root ganglion uh, stimulator patients. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the IBIT care team, uh, but remember, this is a, this is a team effort, and uh, the assistance that the Abbott care team provides not only to the physician's practice, but to the patients is, uh, is very, very important in the treatment process. And on the front end of that therapy, uh, the educational options for the patient in terms of online resources, action cards that can communicate, that can get us in touch with, uh, with our Abbott representatives for more information about the procedure, uh, and social media resources are all there in order to uh, facilitate the highest level of understanding possible before a patient engages in this relatively uh, new therapy to them. Um, luckily for, for us as physicians, this therapy is not new anymore. Uh, we have a lot of experience in our practices and in the real world, and we've seen those real results 
and, uh, and, and it really is inspiring to see what we can do with the technology that's available in our hands today with this therapy.